ready? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Got a lot of word for you tonight, kind of like Sunday night. I don't know about you, but I like a lot of word. Amen. So tonight's more of a Bible study. And so if you're taking notes or not taking notes and you happen to get something out of this, I find that a lot of times I got to go back and listen to things like this again. You know, of course, I've been preaching this stuff for 35 years, so a lot of it I know fairly, fairly good. But it seems like every time I go back to some of my old teachings or new teachings, I learn things that I, I didn't get the last time I did it. And that's the cool thing about the Word when we were talking about Sunday night, the mysteries of the Word. You know, there are things contained in this Word. In fact, uh, if, if the Lord allows me tonight, I'm going to show you just a little nugget that He showed me today as I was studying this. That I never really saw before. I never thought of it. But uh, I'm going to try and break that down a little bit. It's not uh, super cosmic or anything, but it's, it's pretty cool. Maybe you've already seen it before, but for some reason I never looked at it this way. So if you have your uh, Bibles, let's go over to John chapter 1. Book of John chapter 1. You know, one of the things the Lord showed me, uh, I don't know, about 10 years ago when I was studying this subject, uh, He showed me that words are containers of thoughts and intentions. You know, a lot of vowel sounds, people use different language around the world. Some of it just sounds bizarre. You know, when I think of some of the Asian languages, I'm like, it just sounds like, you know, and probably when we speak to them, we probably sound the same way. You know, German sounds a certain way, even though I can kind of make out some of the inflections from it, because I know the English language has a lot of different uh, uh you know, verbs and, and words and things that come from various different languages, from Latin to Spanish to, you know, in, Old English and different things like that. So, but anyway, John chapter 1, I want to talk about the Word tonight. Pastor Craig uh, kind of got on a, a roll a Sunday with, with faith and talking about the Word and Pentecost and various things. And so this is just going to be an addendum to... Because when you go talking about faith and you talk about the Word, you can go in so many directions with God's Word and with the, the subject of faith. Uh, there's so many books that have been written about the subject. So John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I don't know why people uh, of any other religion like the Muslims, they say, well, we believe in Jesus, but He's not God, and He's not God's Son. And we read the Bible, and, you know, I always hear them talk about reading the Bible. They don't read the Bible right, okay, because it would refute that. But in the beginning was the Word, and uh, in the Greek this is logos, okay, and it has a, a kind of a connotation of, of a creative force or a creative type of word, all right? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So we also know that in the beginning in Genesis, God said, He created, He spoke. You know, the Word of God is more powerful when you speak it than when you think it. Not saying there isn't power when you think it, but I'm saying when you are speaking it, it's a lot more powerful, and I know this, this could get into kind of a little bit of a new agey little bit of thing, but it's not a new agey thing, it's an old agey thing because it's what God did, and anybody that's into music or plays an instrument knows like, like when I go in my, my uh, office, I have like six guitars in there, and if they're in tune, when I take my, my acoustic and I pluck it, the E string on the other guitars vibrate too. It's amazing. So we know that words carry vibration with it, okay? And when God said, let there be light, there was a force of that vibration of God's word and his power and the faith of God, which created the universe and created the planets and created the stars. Can you say amen? amen. And the same goes for when he created everything on the earth and in the earth. 
And so everything was created by the word of God, which tells us right there that Jesus, who said to his, his followers and even to some of the Jews, that he was there in the beginning. You know, he was with the Father before the world began. Amen? And so he was there as the Word of God, the Logos of God. And, and I'm not even going to try and break that all down right now because that will just take us in so many different directions. But suffice it to say that Jesus is the living Word and he is God also. Amen? So let's kind of jump a few scriptures down here. Remember, all things were made by him, and without him nothing, not anything was made that was made. In him was a life, and the life was the light of men. All right? Let's bounce on down here a little bit. And uh, verse 11, And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him... To them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, listen to me. How did, how did you receive him? You never saw him. He never came to you, did he? The word was spoken to you. The gospel was spoken to you. And it did something when it went on the inside of you. It caused you to have to think. It, it dealt with certain maybe barriers that you had in believing in God and believing the gospel. Amen. I, some of you may have been raised in church, so it was just second nature for you. I was kind of raised in church, but really didn't get it all. You know what I mean? Not until I finally bowed my knee completely to the Lord and started studying the word. But just so you understand that even though Jesus is the word made flesh, we weren't here when he walked in his flesh. So when we hear about him or somebody tells us the gospel story, it's the word going into us, amen? And as many as received that word, they became sons and daughters of God as they were changed by that word, amen, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, stop there, and I want you to go over to the book of Genesis. So we've got a lot to unpack here to, tonight. Hopefully I'll be able to get to all of it. Let's go over to Genesis chapter 3. Okay, we know already, you all know, that God created the heavens and the earth with words, right? And he, he, you know what? God spoke out loud. God didn't just go like my favorite Martian and think it into existence. Amen? When, when, when there is a, a, a spirit that I have to deal with in a person or in a room or, you know, wherever, I don't go, I don't think to him. I speak to him. I speak the word to it. Amen. If I'm going to pray over you and believe God with you, I'm going to speak a word of healing to you. Right? We're going to speak out loud. I'm not going to go, well, come on up here, sister. Just a minute. Let me think real hard. You know, that process begins in my spirit, in my heart, and it comes out of my mouth. Amen. So it's the spoken word. And Jesus is the living word, and he abides in us. Jesus said, my word is spirit and it's life. Amen? That's in John 6, 63, if you're taking notes. It's the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they're life. So when we're uh, going about doing the Father's business, when we're going about preaching the gospel, we've got to speak the word of God not our, what our suppositions or what we think, amen, or our opinions necessarily. I know sometimes we can't help but give an opinion on something. But for the most part, we've got to give what we know, what's disclosed to us in the Word of God, and we've got to speak it forth, amen, because that's what makes the difference. This living Word of God that we preach, that we speak, makes a difference in people's lives because it's a, it's a, it's a spirit life word, amen? It's not like, you know, something that you read out of some psychological book or something like that. Yeah, it might have somewhat of an impact on somebody's life if it makes sense. But this goes beyond that. And I don't have to have a doctorate degree in psychology or theology in order to speak God's word. God made this word available to the common man. 
Okay? I appreciate the people that are good people that went to college and went to the right theological seminary, not the wrong one. I appreciate their efforts in it. But just because you go to something like that does not make you an ordained minister. Man might make you ordained because you fulfilled a certain curriculum and went through a certain program. But you know what? If you do that, that's great. But you have to be ordained by God. You know, my call and others that, that, are, that are called to the five-fold ministry gift, they receive the call from God. My call didn't come from man. Even though man recognized it, my call came from God. Amen? Um, you can believe it or not believe it. That's neither here nor there, but I think the evidence speaks for itself. Amen? I'm sure there were people back in the day that wondered if that was true or not, but 35 years later, I don't know how they can argue with it, but just saying. Okay? So it's not necessarily uh, a program. It's the Word of God that you study and you take in yourself. My wife was telling me last night about a preacher she's been listening to and how he was teaching on... You know, you just don't read the word. You got to intake the word. You got to you got to feast on the word and make it a part of you. And we'll talk about that in a bit, too. So where did I say to go? Genesis. All right. All right. Genesis chapter one, verse or three, verse 14. And so I want to show you something here. OK, so bear with me. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, Talking about the fall here. Thou art cursed above all the cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, verse 15 is what I want you to focus on. Okay. So in verse 15, what did we tell you when we went to John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. We went on down to the 14th verse, and it talks about the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, So in verse 15, God is speaking to uh, the serpent and to the woman, and He says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. First of all, let me ask you this. When we talk about seed, the seed of man, where does the seed of man normally come from when we say that? No, I, listen, I'm talking physical here. Who, who, who normally is the one with the seed what, when we're talking about seed? It's men. It's men. But did you notice he said the seed of the woman? So he must be making reference to your ovum, a woman's ovum in this respect. Most of the time, it will be talking about a man. But how many of you know that Jesus did not have an earthly father? He had a heavenly father. And so it was the woman's seed. You know, it was the woman that was first deceived. And then man came along with her, right? Okay. So he's talking about, this is a prophecy of how God starts this proto evangelum of how he's going to dismantle what the devil did through the woman. And he talks about the woman having childbirth and all that. But get that, it's the seed he's talking about here is not man's seed, it's an ovum. Okay, that's a little tidbit for you right there. But, okay, so God spoke the word and throughout the time frame from the time he spoke that until Jesus was born of the virgin, until that seed of the woman came to pass and he was born without an earthly father, only a heavenly father and came from her. Amen. That word right there caused him to take on flesh. It started way back there. Okay. So God spoke to our salvation clear back there. Listen, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, what does it say? The word is nigh, nigh thee in thy heart and in, in thy mouth, or in thy mouth and in thy heart. What's that? That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus Christ with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So the salvation that came through God's word all this time frame down to the day that Jesus Christ died and, and went, went to the grave and then rose again, 
that was a fulfillment of this word. That word took all this time. That word only traveled, think about it. It didn't only travel through, through Eve's line and Adam's line. It traveled all the way down past the flood through Abraham to Abraham. Amen. And then in Abraham, he makes a covenant. He says, in thee, in thy seed, shall the whole world be blessed. So think, I want you to see how the word works. It doesn't just, it doesn't just stay stagnant. It's, it's something that sometimes it takes a period of time for it to come, to come to pass and manifest. Likewise, when you're speaking the word of God into a situation, it's going to take time for it to manifest. There's things that have got to line up from the realm of the spirit to the natural. Amen. That's why we're people that live by faith. Hope is our blueprint. When we speak the word of God, we begin to come out of hope into now faith is. Okay. You got to get that. If you're going to operate in faith, you got to start believing you have it now. When I, when I got the healing on this finger, I'm telling you, it took, what, two and a half months before my finger started working again. And, and I had to watch my mouth when somebody said, well, it's, is, it, is, it, is it healed yet? No, it's healed. I believe it's healed. Well, that's, you're lying. No, I'm not. I'm faithing it. I'm not lying. I'm believing that I have it now. But I had to start believing I have it now. Does that make sense? And you say, well, that's a small thing. Well, to me, it was a big thing at the time. Now, why doesn't every other, I don't, I'm not going down that road. All I know is that, that works now. It didn't work, okay? And I didn't want an operation. I already had one on this hand. You know, I had all these fingers and stuff and this cut open for uh, trigger fingers and what's that other thing, carpal tunnel. And it took a year and a half for me to be able to button buttons. I had to have my wife button my buttons. For a while, I couldn't even zip up my own clothes, you know. Just, I didn't want to go through that, so I believed God. Amen? The same with this arm here. I wasn't believing God for that, but somebody else believed for me and my arm was healed. To this day, I mean, praise God. Uh, so I'm just telling you one of my little things, but if you're going to believe God by faith, you're going to have to speak it, and you're going to have to say the right things. And that's really hard sometimes. You know, you get in certain moods or your mind gets in certain places and, and the pain that you're feeling while you're believing God. And you know what? God may do it uh, through a doctor. He may do it through some medicine. Uh, but I want the supernatural. But still, God, God provides for us on our level of belief. Okay? We have faith to move a mountain. Every single one of us that are born again has faith to move the, you know, that mountain represents impossible things, things that we look at and go, that's impossible. But we've seen God do impossible things in all of our lives, in our families' lives, amen? How he does it sometimes, it, sometimes it's like a miraculous healing. Other times it's kind of a gradual thing. But however it comes, I'm praising God because the devil couldn't heal anybody. I couldn't heal anybody, you know, unless I'm a doctor or something. I'm not. Only God can do it. But I'm there to lay hands on the sick and believe that they recover in Jesus' name. Amen? So, um, so God, God spoke our salvation into existence way back when, but it didn't manifest for what? 3,500 years, something like that? That's, that's a long time for, for something like that to take place. But you see, it's just like the word of the prophetic word we have from the Old Testament concerning Jesus' second advent and from the prophecies from Jesus and the, and the apostles themselves. We can be assured, even though it's been 2,000 years since Jesus died for our sins and rose again, that everything they said, everything John said, it will come to pass because it's the word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. So we're going to talk about the principle that makes the impossible a reality. And so we're talking about confession today. Speaking the word of faith opens the doors of the miraculous. Go over to Mark 11. I know we were over there Sunday morning a little bit, but let's go over there again. Mark 11. Everybody should know this if they're faith people. So I'm not telling you anything totally new. Mark 11, 22 concerning that fig tree and Peter's amazement that the fig tree had died just like Jesus said. And Jesus answering him said unto him, Have faith in God. 
Uh, some people like to say, have the faith of God. And I would say, have faith like God has faith. If God speaks a word and he believes it, and, this, and what you're speaking is according to biblical truth, and you have faith, then things are going to happen on your behalf. What, what happens is faith doesn't work. Let me, let me just throw this out here. If you feel condemned, if you're walking around, I'm, I'm a sinner, I feel condemned, whether it's true or not, whether the devil's just messing with your head, faith doesn't work very good. You'll cut faith off because faith is of the heart. So the head has to be renewed because everything from here has to come out in here to come out of this mouth. Can you say amen? And when we're talking about this realm out here that we live in, we're, we're tapping into something spiritual. Faith is a force that God has given us. Uh, I'm using force, you know, just because I can't think of any other way of saying it. And faith is your servant when you're a servant of God. So what you speak by faith and you call forth by faith and you believe as a, something impossible or a situation that you want God to get involved with, you've got to have faith that God's going to do it. That means you've got to believe that God is, and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So I, I say to people, you know, a lot of times when they got cancer or they got some problem they've been diagnosed with, you can't be casual about it. The people that I've actually seen healed of these kind of uh, diseases and things, they got serious. They got serious. I mean, they, they had scripture in their bathroom. They had scripture on their, their uh, refrigerator. You know what I'm talking about. They had, they had books uh, they would not watch certain TV shows. They really got serious about their mind because belief is up here, you know. And, and they, would, they would, like, you couldn't talk unbelief to them. They didn't want to be around people that were negative. You know, I'm sure you can't totally stay away from everybody negative, but their life depended upon it. God was willing to heal them. You say, well, why is God so, why has it got to be so, this? I don't know. That's not my problem. That's up to God why he does or doesn't. You know, I'm not God. He just told me what I'm supposed to do. Amen. But if you're going to be, if you're going to be uh, having uh, God move something out of the way that's impossible, whether it be physically, financially, mentally, uh, whatever, you're going to have to know that you have a word to stand on. It has to be based, at, you know, it might not be the exact scripture, but it has to be within the context of what God says is ours by inheritance. And the thing is, God said, I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, that epignosis that comes from the heart uh, actually seeing that thing being a truth on a different level than just reading it. Okay, are you listening? Words are containers, but they've got to be containing the Word of God and the thoughts and intents of God. That's why when people hear people speaking in other tongues, they're like, you know, there's some people like me that's exercised it for years and years. I can go off. You know, I'm not saying the same old syllables over and over again. But what God showed me a long time ago, it really doesn't matter whether it's repetitive or not because you're just doing something with your mouth that God has said that we can do to edify us and to intercede with, amen? And so what he's doing is he's putting in his thoughts and intents and you're giving voice to it. I don't understand what it is unless I get an interpretation. You don't understand because that's not tongues for interpretation in the assembly of God, which equals prophecy. But I'm praying in the spirit according to Romans chapter 8, and verse 26 and Jude uh, chapter 1 and verse 20, amen? And I'm praying in the spirit. Amen? It's, it's taking my, my gifting that God has given me by giving me the Holy Spirit, and I'm, I'm speaking in those other tongues, and God is filling those. You say, why is that true? It is totally true. Well, there's not tongues for today. Well, you've been listening to the wrong preacher. Because the Bible says that the promise... What, what Peter said, he was saying, what you see today with these people speaking in tongues, with, with prophecy and people speaking in other dialects that they don't know, he said that promise is unto you. If you receive Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit, and everything you see happening here, that promise is unto you, 
unto your children, to all those that are afar off, that includes down the timeline in other nations, and to as many, this qualifies it, to as many as God will call. How many of you believe you're called? Well, then the gifts of the Spirit are for you too. Uh, tongues for edification is for any believer that will believe. Just saying. You know, there's a lot of believers that don't believe, and so they don't have it. What you don't believe that God says you can have, you won't have. It's that simple. I'm one of those that will believe, <laughs> I'll believe a lot of things that God says, and I'll experience them. And then there's these people that will go, well, you, you know, oh, we don't believe that, brother. Well, you don't believe it, and you don't see it. It doesn't happen in your church. But it happens in my church because we believe it. Amen? Oh, we, don't make it we don't make it the gospel. It's just a part of the gospel. It's just a part of the benefits. Amen? I don't know why I'm going that direction, but you know, a lot of times God has me say things for a reason. Sometimes I'm just preaching to the choir, but who knows who's out there? But there's such an argument and a division about it. Amen? I, I think it's I think in, in uh, first first Corinthians chapter or wait is it yeah first Corinthians chapter fourteen when Paul says uh, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues that should settle it do you believe that's the word of God well you know Paul wasn't really talking for God at that yeah every every word in the Bible that's canon of Scripture is inspired by the Holy Ghost. Even if a little bit of the apostles who wrote it, you know, the pen that God used to write it, uh, has a little flavor of their personality into it. What do we believe here? The Bible is true. That means we believe it's inerrant. We believe the Bible that we have right now, especially for me, the King James. I, you, be, you believe what you want with your Bible, but for me, it's the King James. That's, that's mine, okay? But the Bible is true. Jesus is Lord. Faith is a victory. Love never fails. And Jesus is coming again soon. Those are the five pillars of this church right here. Okay? Uh, and we could preach sermons on all of those pillars. All right. So we're talking about confession in the book of Mark. He says, for, for verily I say unto you. Now, you might go, well, he's just talking to the disciples. Well, he was at that point. But he saw fit that they write it in a book and send it on down the timeline to you and I. Do you believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is, is relevant to some degree to you and I? Absolutely. Okay. I will say this, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the chronicles of Jesus as he ministered to the Jewish people. But there's relevancy in it for us too. Otherwise, we wouldn't have it in the New Testament. It'd stay in the Old Testament. Amen? Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt, shall not doubt in his heart. Okay, we're talking about the, the, the trifold being called man who has a spiritual mind, who has a carnal mind. The carnal mind made up of flesh and blood is where we uh, right now are filing away all the experiences that are temporal here and even spiritual things. But there is a part of our being that's eternal and it's the spiritual side. And if you're in Christ, it's been made alive and you're a new creation reality. So you have the, the spiritual mind which has what? It has intuition. It has conscience which is the voice of the Spirit. Intuition is the ear of the Spirit. Because when you get things from God, you just know. Like when God talks to me, uh, you know, He doesn't always talk to me in English. <laughs> Impressions, vision, little mental visions sometimes. But when He's talking to me, He talks to me through my spirit, by the Holy Spirit. And my, my spiritual mind, which is renewed to the Word of God, my carnal mind renewed to the Word of God, okay? The intermediary is the will. But my mind picks up on the voice of God and the things of God through intuition, which is the ear of the Spirit. And when you pray in tongues, there's an exercise for that where you can learn where, where words of knowledge, words of wisdom, and, and different things, discerning of spirits comes to, for me it's back here, but actually that's just how I perceive it. <clears throat> okay, so when I pray in the Spirit, it brings my mind over to this side over here more. When I'm in the Word, it brings my mind over to this side. When I'm praying in natural language, it brings my mind over to this side. So I'm more in tune with God when He wants to speak to me. And maybe He will and maybe He won't. I mean, God's not always going around going, Hey, Jim, 
Hey, what do you think about this? He's not asking me questions, okay? Just saying, all right? So, but in the middle is my will. My will, my will is the arbiter of my being. And here's, here's the carnal mind. Here's my will. Here's the flesh side of, or the spiritual side of my mind that's been born again, that's tuned into God, that wants to do what God wants to do. And so my will's like this. If I'm feeding on all this junk, eternal, external stuff out here, then this will goes, okay, let's go this way. If, if I'm feeding on the Word of God, I'm praying, I'm seeking God, I'm denying certain things of the flesh that are not healthy for me, then my mind is tuned in over here. And it wants to do the things of God. It's that simple. Well, it sounds simple, but it's like losing weight. It's kind of hard. Yeah, it is. Because you have to be diligent when you do this stuff, right? Does that make sense? That's kind of a side trip. But, but he's saying, okay, he's saying, therefore I say. Notice there's say. It's not I think. For verily I say, verse 23, unto you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the disciples. He's talking to us. But you know how I know he's talking to us? Listen to this word. For verily I say unto you that whosoever, whosoever, does that not qualify it? Some people will go, well, he was just talking. to this. No, he's talking to whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, shall not doubt in his heart, that spiritual side of you, but believe, shall believe that those things which he saith, shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, let me qualify that. He'll have whatsoever he saith that's within the will of God. You can't pray outside the will of God. You can't call those things that aren't as though they were outside the will of God. What is the will of God? It is the bequeathment of what... See, the Old, the old Testament was a covenant, an old covenant. The New Testament is more than just a covenant. It is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ that he leaves to his heirs. He did all the work, he made all the money, so to speak, and he left it to us. He gave us the principles of the kingdom, he did them, he lived them, and he gave them to us. That whosoever would believe. So our belief has got to be based on something. Are you all following me or am I boring you to death? I, sometimes I get too deep with this stuff. Everything is based on what we believe. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means you've got to believe certain things. Amen? To be a convert is one thing, to get born again, but to, to be a disciple of Christ, you've got to be a believer. That means you've got to believe in something. A lot of people don't believe in things. A lot of people say, well, I'm just going to believe in this and that, but I don't believe in this other stuff. Well, it's incomplete. Because the gospel is something that's whole. We don't have a smorgasbord here in the Bible. Well, I think I'll just eat a little bit of this because it sounds good, but the other stuff, I don't want nothing to do with it. No, that's not how it is. It was made in completeness at least as much as God wanted to show us and give to us, and we need to accept it all. And if we don't understand it, we need to ask God to help us understand it. How is he going to do it? Well, he's going to send teachers. While you study the Word, the Holy Spirit's going to begin to show you things. Amen? You love the Lord. So words, words are powerful. And he says, uh, Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you, that you receive them. You know what this means in, in the Hebrew, most of you that have studied faith. It means that you believe you have it now. You have it now. Everything should be past tense. Have it now. I have it now. When my finger hurt and my finger would lock, when I couldn't play my guitar, uh, it hurt when I played the drums real bad. Uh, I believe that it was healed. Was it, was it actually healed right now? Well, in my mind, it was healed. In my mind, I was seeing the day when I could do my cowboy chords and whatever else, right? I was believing like that. And that's what came to pass. Did you go to the doctor and get shot? I didn't go to the doctor. I didn't take even Advil for it. I believed God. I give God all the glory. Oh, pastor, you got such great faith. I don't have any more faith than anybody else has. What I did was I worked the principle. Will it work for everything? Well, he says whatsoever things, and, and you know, he paid the price for our healing. Why don't you have healing tonight with your, with your hip and stuff? Well, I'm believing I'm healed in Jesus' name. 
But it's hurting really bad. I got to tell you that right now. It hurts really bad. It's hard to get up out of a chair. So that's the reality of it. You know, when Abraham was believing for a son, he, the Bible says that he considered not his body now dead. They'll say, well, see, he didn't even consider his... He knew about his body. He was in his late 90s. So was his wife. He knew he was dead. He couldn't have babies naturally. He had to have a supernatural thing happen. He considered not his body a thing that would keep God from being able to do the impossible. You see what I'm saying? You can find that, I think, over, what is it, Romans chapter 4, verse 17, somewhere around there. Uh, he knew what, that he was old, but he, God had made him a promise. And he, he was going to believe God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. How do we get saved? We believe God. And Jesus comes into our heart, and we put on the righteousness of God. So it's always been by faith, salvation through every... Every phase that God has brought mankind through, it always took faith to believe something that God said. Okay? Uh, how do you get a better believing mind? Well, you've got to renew your mind. The Bible tells us in first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, uh, taking thoughts captive, every lofty thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I might, might, not, might not be quoting it completely right, but you can go look at it. So what does it mean? How do I take thoughts captive? Well, that's not a thought of God. The, you know where thoughts come from. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the word of God is alive. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, pierces to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when I have the Word of God in me, it's a filter. And what I, what I perceive from the world, or what some man tries to preach to me, or whoever, if it doesn't filter through the Word of God that I have in my heart, I don't want it. It's got to line up with the Word of God. Even things that I have, have really got, don't have a revelation on, there's things that I, I didn't have a revelation on. I listened to some of the stuff Perry Stone teaches, and I'm like, hmm, that's pretty interesting. I'm going to go look at it and see if, if that's true for myself. I don't just, even though I love his teaching, there's things I've caught him on, my own personal self. 99% of what he says, as far as I can tell so far, has been really good, what he's taught. But there's been a couple things that I know he's wrong on. Yet I think he's one of the best teachers, and you ask me, who do you listen to? I listen to him most of the time. I listen to Rick Renner, but I've heard Rick Renner say some things. I've heard this one say, I've probably said things that aren't quite right. I'm not going to put my salvation... Uh, to any one man. I'm going to trust the Holy Ghost. And I'll listen to the men and women that I know are anointed, but I'm not going to fully look at them and go, oh my goodness, I'm not worthy. Because you know what? God has made me able to understand Scripture too, and He's made you that way because He's given us the Holy Ghost. And you know who wrote the Bible? The Holy Ghost wrote the Bible. And somebody goes, I don't understand this. Well, I know somebody who does, and if he wants to show it to me, he will. But if it's in the Word of God, it's a mystery maybe right now, but it's a mystery that I've been, I've been given the right to know. Jesus said it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Those that are without, no, they don't understand it unless we help them. But I can understand it. You can understand it. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. So anyway, let's move on. i got a lot more here. I always do this, you know, you get so much of God's word in you over the years and it's hard to just go right straight down the line, even though I got an outline. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, and you need to write these down and look them up because some of them I'm just qu quoting off the top of my head, so I might not have them right completely, every word, iota. So you need to go to them because I don't have time to go to every scripture that I got here, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13 tells us that we, well, I'm, I better go over there because I'm not quoting it right yet. Let me get over there real quick. We have the same spirit of faith. How many of you know that? That's the Holy Spirit, right? He says, we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have spoken. 
We also believe and therefore we speak. So this is a prophetic word that, that I believe is in the Old Testament, brought into the New, because a lot of things in the Old Testament are relevant for us. So how did God speak? He spoke. He spoke Jesus into existence clear back in the Garden of Eden. And that word took all that time to come to pass. And he says, I've done that. That's the Holy Spirit talking. I've done that. And then it switches to us. Paul begins to talk on our behalf. And he says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, here's God, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore we speak. What do we speak? We speak the word of God. We speak the the." the will of God, which is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ concerning what is to come, concerning what we have as his believers and his children. Amen. So if you don't get in the word, if a, if a believer doesn't get in the word, how's he going to believe? If he doesn't study the word, how's he going to know what, what's his or what's hers? You have to get into the word. That's why this stuff doesn't, doesn't come to everybody just that easy. In fact, even when you get a good teacher who gets up and can really teach the word good, you'll learn some things, but if you don't write it down, if you don't go back and listen to it again, if you don't meditate on it, you'll lose it. It'll, it'll, it'll kind of drift away. Because you know what? Men and women of God have given their lives to this thing. They have put hours upon hours. Folks, I'm not bragging, and I'm not the best teacher in the world, but I'm telling you right now, I got 50 years of studying in it, in this thing. And I still don't feel like I know everything. I know I don't know everything. Uh, I for, I've forgotten a lot of, that I used to know, too, because if you don't stay in the Word, at least my mind, the human mind has a propensity to lose it. But it doesn't take that much once I get get it renewed a little bit or I get back on you know sometimes I just go to my old sermon notes and look at them so I'll remember what I know that's what I'm doing tonight actually you know this is a this is a teaching that I studied years and years ago it's been preached more than once here in various ways so I believe therefore I've spoken also you got Romans uh, 17 okay you can write that one down Hebrews uh, 3 1 there Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Listen, see, we're not normal people, folks. We are a new species of being, according to uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We are a new creation in, in Christ Jesus. Amen? Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of your confession. Some, some translations say profession. But profession means the same thing as confession. If you'll look it up in, in the, the concordance, it's a confession of faith. We're to hold fast to that, the Bible says. Don't change our stance on a revelation that God has given us. Go over to Isaiah 55.10. Isaiah 55.10. This is one of my favorite scriptures here. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but waters the earth. In other words, it's going to do the purpose that it was created to do, right? It waters the earth, and make, maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. Stop right there. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 22, 23, that we are the body of Christ on this earth. If we're the body of Christ on this earth, there's a mouthpiece down here. Guess who the mouthpieces are? We are. Not just me, we. Okay. So now I've been given the right to speak the word of God, to, to preach the gospel. Not just up here, you guys out there too, right? I'm just a teacher to the, to the body of Christ. But we all have the right, the ability to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ one-on-one -on -one or wherever we are. Amen? And he says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So it's God working through us when we speak the word of God. He is using us as his children, as his mouthpiece. Now, obviously, God himself has spoken these things, right? We can't speak outside of what God has spoken. And there's some things that I think are, 
are mostly to certain individuals or nations or whatever, but we can see the concept in there, and if it works for them, it'll work for us. Okay? But when I'm speaking the Word of God under the unction of the Holy Spirit, it's going into you tonight. Now, if you were sitting here and you don't know any of this stuff, you've got to deal with it. Maybe, you, maybe a person would be sitting there going, I don't believe that. You know, some, what, you talk about tithes and offerings, somebody goes, tithing is under the law. Well, it was under the law, but it was before the law. The concept, the, the, uh, the ability for Abraham to pay tithes to Melchizedek and be blessed because of it. Well, Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. I don't have a problem with tithes and offerings. I just don't believe that it needs to be preached like the law. Okay? But I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we have. It's a kingdom blessing that's left over from the book of Malachi that we can tap into that principle. We don't have to be compelled. You should not be compelled to give. You should give out of your heart. Amen? And not go, well, I just, I'm going to make deals with uh, my mind and I think that I should give off my net or I shouldn't give off my... You know, that's between you and God, not between me and you. I'm just going to tell you what I do. Okay? I practice tithing. You know, maybe it's not exactly like how you would do it. I don't know, but I practice. Amen? I could probably do a lot better and I give lots of offerings too. You say, are you tooting your own horn? No, I'm tooting God's horn. Because I'm an example to the believers, i got to tell you what I do, how I get success. And I can tell you, one of the ways to get out of being poor or to, to progress, and why do I want to be a, a little more wealthier? Why do I want money? Because for me, I want to take care of my family, but also I want the gospel to go forward. I want to be able to be a giver and not a taker all the time. And there was a day where all I could do was take. Because I didn't have the resources, but I began to do what God said in His Word and call things that aren't as though they were, and God began to bless my family and I. And it just came on a sparkling wind. No, my wife went to work, went to went to school, and I did the the ministry full time and also got to take care of my little kids. So I was Mr. Mom for a while. I got to actually experience why no man is as good as a woman when it comes to being a mom. I'm not kidding you. I remember. I, it, Okay, you want to hear a little thing here? Um, my sister, my youngest sister, I, she used to call me when she was frustrated with her husband. It was a long time ago, okay? All of her kids are big, grown up. But he'd come home because he worked really hard, and he'd sit down in the chair, and he didn't want to interact because he was tired. She goes, Jim, my husband doesn't want to get involved and do it. I said, well, I'll leave him alone. He's tired. You sit at home eating bonbons and watching Days of Our Lives. That went over real good. <laughs> you know, and yeah, I hurt her feelings, and later I had to apologize after I took care of my, my youngest son, Nathan, and my two, two daughters back there and foster children, running them around to appointments, making dinner and lunch and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff changing Aki diapers to the point of where now I can't use any of that uh, hand uh, sanitizer because it'll my hands will break out because I used so much of it when I, I was changing Maddie's, then I changed Annie's, you know. I'm like, good gracious, I want to go back to work. This is, this is too much. So I, there was a time when I called my sister back a few years later. I said, you remember that time I said that to you? I said, I want to tell you I am sorry. <laughs> I didn't have any clue what women do. Plus doing all the, you know, the laundry and that's, any, anyway. No man is, is made to do that kind of stuff. I'd rather work out in the hot sun on a roof. But it was a great experience. <laughs> Just saying. When you think that you're going to prosper, you've got to be willing to do some things. Amen. You've got to go after some things. All right. So shall my word be. You know, you're as close to a miracle as you are to the kingdom of God. And what is the kingdom of God? Listen to this, Luke 17, 21. Neither shall you say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It also means that it's among you, around you. It's accessible to you that are, that are a part of the kingdom, amen? Even though there will be a literal kingdom that comes to this earth, and that's why we pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 
that's just not a vain repetitious prayer, but it is the desire of the Lord, and He desires us to pray in that manner. Amen? We're believing for the day when this crazy world is transformed into the wonderful, glorious world that Jesus has for us. Amen? And we want to bring as many people across with us as we can. So you're as close to a miracle as you are to the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is within you. And when you're, when you're operating in kingdom principles, you're speaking the word of God. Yes. You know, I mean, listen, this is really hard. I do it too. I'm up here preaching this, but I have a hard time with this too. Sometimes I'm, I'm saying what I'm seeing. Man, this place is so messed up. Everything's bummed out. It's just a mess, right? It, it, some days it gets like that. But the Bible tells me, and here's, all of us are guilty of this. Whatever things are good, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are pure, whatever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. Man, I know when I lose my peace, I've been watching too much crazy stuff. I've been listening to too many negative people. Amen? And, and that's when you got the choice. You've got the choice to cleanse your mind, to cast down imaginations, to, to look with different eyes to the author and finisher of your faith. Does that make sense? The word is a seed. It must be sown. Confessing God's word causes faith to come. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Amen. Number three, it renews the mind. Words transmit faith or fear. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Amen? I'm telling you, when things get crazy, you better know the Word of God, because the Word of God, like I just said in, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, is sharper than any two-edged sword. It, will, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It'll tell you what's coming from the flesh. It'll tell you what's coming from the soul. It'll tell you what's coming from the spirit and which spirit it is. Every believer needs to ask for the discerning of spirits. Maybe not on the level of where you see into the demonic realm and so forth, but where you perceive what spirit things are of or what spirit people are of. How many of you have ever had somebody that just smiles so good, they got such a good smile, but their intentions of their heart are not cool? Sometimes it's hard to tell, especially those of us that are naive, not me anymore, but, but have never been hurt by people in a bad way, stabbed, beaten, or whatever. Amen? There are people out there that are, think of, think of that one guy. What, what was the guy back in the 70s that went around killing women? Huh? Ted Bundy. Of course, there were more than him. But there he was a handsome dude, you know, kind of a surfer dude. And, and he fooled a lot of people, and then he, he killed them. You know, and I'm not trying to believe for that stuff. I'm just saying there are wicked people out there that got demons in them that smile real good, look real pretty, look real handsome. And, and as believers, you know, we're out there going, we're trying to be all-inclusive and love people. But we better be able to discern people's spirits because there are dangerous people out there right now. Huh? Yeah, thank you, brother. I agree with you. A whole bunch of them there. And some right here in this town, too, that are in leadership. But you know what? We bind the spirit behind them, amen? And we believe for God to come in to our situation. Okay, it renews the mind. Um, I already used 2 Corinthians 10. Three through five, the word is, uh, our weapons are not carnal. All right, number five, it keeps the answer continually before you. We must set our minds on the realities of God's word and not the realities of the natural realm. That goes back to Abraham. His body was old. Sarah was old. God said, you're going to have a kid next year. Sarah laughed. They had to name him Isaac, which means laughter. Because God's word came to pass. So after she laughed, did she believe? She had to have believed or she wouldn't have conceived. He had to believe or he, he wouldn't have conceived. But the reality was they shouldn't be able to. When we're thinking of a supernatural healing or something, the reality is you got to go to the doctor and get it done. When, when I tore this ligament here, the reality was I needed to go get an operation. Had a doctor even tell me that. And if I take my shirt off, I can show you the line where my muscle started to crawl up my arm. But that night when Al prayed for me and Craig and everybody during prayer, 
I wasn't even in faith of my own, but they prayed for me. And Al goes, move your arm. And I moved my arm, and if I did that, it would, it would cramp on me. And I'm moving it and moving it. And then I reached down and I felt, and I had a tendon there that I didn't have before. So our faith sometimes can cover other people uh, who, when we believe for them, when they can't believe for themselves. And that was, that's what happened to me. I had no dog in that fight, but my brothers and sisters were like praying for me and God decided to go ahead and do it. Amen. Praise God. I thank God for that. That's a big deal to me, okay? If you've ever been healed by God supernaturally and you know it, it's a big deal. Especially when you think, oh, I'd have to go in under the knife and have three different cuts and a, and a little uh, screw put there to attach the, the tendon to. No, thank you. Scared faith. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Keeps the answer before our faith. We must set our minds on the realities of God's word and not on the realities of this natural realm. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Now, when he says that, he's not saying don't talk. If you watch the Jews, they sit there and they go. They're muttering over and over again the word of God. That's how they did it. That's how they meditated. They muttered it. Okay. Um, Joshua 1, 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Now you say, law, we're not under the law. Listen to me. The law is not always bad when it comes to kingdom principles. Uh, for instance, uh, what's, what's a natural law? If I, if I climb up on a roof and jump, what's going to happen? I'm going to fall. That's a natural law. Okay, It's a good law to know because if you don't have a parachute or you're not in a plane, you don't want to do that, right? So there are laws that govern things in the spirit that bleed over to the natural. Yeah, there are the laws, don't do this, don't do that. But some of it was blessings, because if you remember in Deuteronomy, God gave them all kinds of blessings if they obeyed his voice, and cursings if they didn't obey his voice. Okay? So he says, This book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night. Boy, that sounds like you got to put effort into it. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So this is a principle that works right now. If I want to renew my mind, i got to meditate on God's word. Not all the do's and don'ts, but the things that God says. Be ye holy, for I'm holy. You know, there are things, you know, people go, well, I don't need to worry about it because I'm a grace case and I'm already saved and I don't have to live it. Yeah, maybe you're right, and maybe you're wrong. I wouldn't bank on it. But you know what I would bank on? That if you don't position yourself by obedience, once again, you'll feel condemnation more than just conviction. And when you feel condemned, faith will not flow. You kind of have this natural thing in you that says, I don't deserve for God to do anything good for me because I've been such a bad boy or a bad girl. Yeah, people do that. I do it sometimes. When I've messed up, I, I want to kick myself. You want to kick yourself sometimes. Now, if you don't, you're farther down the road than me. But I'm just telling you, when, when I'm not feeling spiritual or like I'm right with God or right with somebody, things aren't going to work. I don't feel like my prayers are going to work when I'm like that. Not saying you got to have everything perfect. But you've got to at least agree with God's word that you must forgive. That's why we didn't read that part of uh, Mark eleven twenty five, 25, where it says when you stand praying, if you have ought against somebody, forgive. Because if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. Why? You block faith then. It doesn't work. Jesus is telling you that. Okay? You know, uh, just remember, forgiveness isn't always how you feel. It's by faith. Because I'm telling you, if somebody kills your kid, Forgiving them is going to be something that's going to be super, super difficult, you know. But really what forgiveness is, in a nutshell, in my opinion, is turning over your right for revenge or your right to be right and letting God be God. That doesn't mean they're going to get away with it. That isn't like, okay, you've forgiven them, so I won't do anything to them. No, when you turn it over to God, if they don't repent, then God will deal with them. Someday, if it's not on this earth, it'll be afterwards. You're not going to get, listen, you're not going to get away with it. God says, be not, be not deceived. He's not mocked whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
That's a part of the principles of the kingdom. And, and everything that we do is a seed. Everything that we do uh, will come back on you, good or bad. That's really how it is in, when you're reading Galatians uh, chapter, uh, what is it, chapter 5 or chapter 6. I, I'm goofed up on that. Look, uh, look it up. I think it's chapter 6, verse something, verse 9, something like that. Anyway, don't take my word for it. Go to the scriptures. So, amen. I'm kinda, I have to hurry through this because we're almost done. Okay. All right, here's the, here's the greatest principle in this. When we speak the word of God, it energizes your heart from which flows the forces of life, okay? Proverbs 4, 20 through 23, My son, attend to my words, incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it is the issues of life. So Romans 10, 8 says, but what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made. And any of you that have been here for a while, what do I call that? The faith accelerator. Amen. Jesus is Lord over everything in our lives. And when I confess his word in a situation, my finger is healed in Jesus' name. Oh, my goodness, it still hurts. My finger is healed in Jesus' name. My arm is healed. My hip is healed. Whatever, okay? I don't relent. I, I, I see it in my mind's eye. All right? So I confess it, and it's the word of God says that by his stripes I'm healed. By his stripes I'm healed. If, if the elders will lay hands upon me because I call upon them and they anoint me with oil, I'm healed in Jesus' name. Well, no, you're hurting. I'm healed in Jesus' name. I see it. I have it now. That's really what you got to do. Well, you sound ridiculous, brother. I have it now. You know, it's easy when I have a headache, which I never get anymore, to go take an aspirin. Or not an aspirin, an Advil. But that Advil, I used to take droves of it and I almost lost my kidneys because of it so now guess what I can't do I can't take no Advil so if I got pain I just got to suck it up I don't take any other drugs either I got to suck it up so there's only one person I can turn to when I'm when I'm hurting like that it's got to be God amen so the faith accelerator is I speak the word of God or I speak a principle of God over something that I'm believing for, even if it seems impossible. So what if it doesn't work, Pastor? Well, what if it does? And what if it doesn't work? Well, okay, if you want to go down that road, then go to the doctor because all healing comes from God. Amen? Uh, certain things that doctors give you, though, are temporary and they cause other issues. If you'll listen to those people on, on those commercials for drugs, they always tell you about they got the person running through the tulips and having a happy life, right? And then it goes through this litany of all the things that it may cause cancer, it causes an enemy. You might have a heart attack, you might have, and you're like, oh, I should just rush out and get it, right? <laughs> but for some people, the, the benefit out, outlays the risk. But there's always going to be a risk when man's involved in it. Right. Now you go get an operation, they're doing really great things. I mean, they're doing these heart valve things now where they're just running them up your arm or down your neck, and you don't have to get your whole chest cracked. Oh, there's miracles. Where did they get that, that knowledge from? To me, it came from God. All healing is from God because if God is not making your body heal up, you'll die. You'll get an infection. And so he works through doctors too. Do you love the Lord? So it sets faith in motion. It releases the angelic hosts according to Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, you angels who excel in strength and do his word. So we're going to be speaking his word. Can you say amen? Rise to your feet. I have more, but we'll stop here. Amen? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, But I say unto you, Words are so important. Jesus says, I say unto you that every idle word that a man shall speak, they shall give account of on the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And that's one of my least favorite scriptures, because I got a big mouth. How about you? You got to get that thing in order, amen? If we want to see God move, we got to be careful what we're saying, how we're speaking, 
what we're believing for. Because if you believe, even out of fear, you may see that thing come to pass. Just like Job, that thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. Love the Lord. Sister Cindy, pray and release us tonight, if you would. Focus on this. I know I might not have done it super justice, but I'm telling you, do a Bible study on this. Get this, get this inside of you. Build it inside of you. Amen. Pastor, you know, tomorrow is.